So welcome again. We will begin this wonderful pre-con just shortly. In the meantime, I would like to thank our platinum sponsors, which are listed on this slide here, as well as our gold sponsors and silver sponsors for their wonderful support. Next slide, please. On behalf of NHF, welcome to the VWD pre-con where we will be talking more about our new VWD guidelines, which truly is a new horizon. My name is Lena Voland and I'm the Director of Education at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Now for privacy purposes, please join us in renaming your screen by hovering over the image and clicking on the three little dots in the right hand corner. Then you can select the rename function and change your Zoom participation name as listed here with a couple of examples. Next slide, please. Now, how will you actually get the most out of this session and what are a couple of the reminders that we need here? So use the chat box or the Q&A feature to write in your questions or comments. Our speakers will try to respond to as many as possible at the end of this session. Now also make sure that you give us some feedback at the end of this. We will utilize this in our evaluations and future planning. And then also just to let you know, this presentation will be recorded and it will be available later to watch as well. Next slide, please. Now here are a couple of disclosures for the speakers today, as you can see here. Again, I would like to welcome Nicole Scappi to our floor here today. Now, again, she's working as an educational specialist for NHF, but she's also a person who's living with VWD. Now, she has been actively involved in the bleeding disorder community since 2003 and has been very active, not only on a national level, but also internationally. Now, Nicole served as an intern for NHF and the Western Pennsylvania chapter. She was on NHF's board of directors as an NYLI representative, and she's also on NHF's VWD working group. Um, she is on the annual meeting planning committee as well. Now, currently, she also serves on the World Federation of Hemophilia's Youth Committee. So welcome, Nicole, and thank you so much for your wonderful contributions to the VWD community. Thank you for that amazing introduction. I'm like blushing if you guys can't see, but I'm definitely blushing. That was, um, thank you that for that, Lena. But hello everyone at home. Um, I, I really wish we were all in the same room right now, but hey, at least we have Zoom. And my name is Nicole Scappi, and as Lena said, I'm an education specialist at NHF, and have been so for three years now and she said 2003 is when I've been involved so I'm not even going to do the math but it just ages me a little bit how long I've been involved with this community and I'm also based in Pittsburgh Pennsylvania and for my sports fans on here go Steelers <laughs> um, and in addition I have bone brand disease type 1 along with my siblings my mother and my late grandfather next slide please Thank you. So today I'm really going to just share my story and some lessons that I learned along my journey that I hope are helpful for you. Um, so I'll just begin at the beginning. So I spent a lot of time in the emergency room pre before my diagnosis. So like any of it, I bumped my arm, twist an ankle, and it would swell so significantly, like so much more than the other people and kids around me. So in the ER, the ER physicians and some orthopedics I visit noticed that it was so significant the swelling in the different limbs that it had to be a growth plate fracture somewhere. So every time that would happen, I would go ahead and they would put a cast on the injury site. And I really think back as I was preparing for this and I just remembered the pain from the cast. It's like my limbs would just swell up and they, the cast would get so tight. However, though, like a couple of weeks later when the swelling would go down, I would be able to slide those suckers right off, which my parents weren't very happy about or the physicians, but I just thought that was kind of funny. And in addition, I remember being in the emergency room quite a lot. And I remember my dad saying this, like, Nick, you really got to let us know when the pain is real. Like, we can't be here all the time. Like, this just isn't going to work. So that was all happening. But if we just fast forward a little bit, a few casts and years later, there were actually, we found out one to two real fractures that I had probably out of like 16 or so casts. And we came to find all of the injuries were in fact joint bleeds. And I have an amazing hematologist to thank for that. And this individual wasn't my hematologist. And I was just seeing this person because 
that's who was in that day. So thank you to them. And it did actually take me a few years to be able to access Factor. Because I'm a type one, I was told that you are type one, type one patients cannot have joint bleeding, only type two or threes can. So if you take a look in the pictures, if you could see Cass and Nicole as well in some of those family photos, I have a lot of my pictures and family photos, it's just like I always have a cast. Um, but you can also see an example of a knee bleed that I actually had pretty recently, but that's what I would do. I would start taking pictures of these bleeds and then write things down and I'd be like, okay, look, like I really think I'm having joint bleeds. So I think that um, that really was beneficial for me and getting on factor definitely changed the trajectory of my life which was great for me. And I also struggle with menorrhagia, but I will get into that a little bit more when we get later into this presentation. Next, I'm really gonna talk about some procedures that I've had um, and the importance of listening to your body and preparing for the panic moments. Um, please learn from my mistakes. So when I was about, I think 16, I had a tonsillectomy. It went well, did my factor, did all the planning before. Um, but a few days later, I had like the worst stomach ache of my life. I, I just can't even tell you how sick I felt, but I felt like I was kind of dying and it hurt for days. So I went, ended up going to the emergency room and they gave me so much pain medication. Like they gave me a little bit first and I was still like almost screaming. They told me to be quiet. Then they gave me more. And I was kind of just like in this daze where I was kind of crying still, but I was like, all right, I'll go home, whatever. So a couple hours later, I was at home, I woke, woke my mom up and I'm like, hey mom, I'm throwing up blood. And um, I was rushed to the emergency room and they actually ended up finding that they didn't cauterize a main part in the back of my throat whenever they had done the procedure originally. So I've been bleeding into my stomach for days. So they ended up pumping three pints of blood out of my stomach, hence, hence the stomach pain. Um, and they actually had to end up doing emergency surgery again the physicians on this probably know what it's called. I forget every time, but before they did emergency surgery, they had like this long match stick and they try to like burn the back of your throat and that did not work for me. So they went up, um, they went ahead and did the surgery. But the point of the story is I should have never walked out of the hospital that night. I knew something was wrong and very wrong because I'm not a complainer. I don't like to be in the hospital at all. And I don't even like pain medication. So I definitely should have not left and advocated more for myself. And the second lesson from the story is prepare for panic mode. Um, during the hemorrhage, I remember like waking my mom up. She called my daddy, hung up on her and was like, just let me know what happens tomorrow. We called back, but everybody was kind of just in a daze. It was late and we didn't really have anything written down. We didn't have an emergency plan. We didn't have even a travel letter might have come in handy then um, or even an emergency bag with factor in it. So when something happens, like as my dad says, preparation is the key to efficiency. Prepare, 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 have that bag, have that plan, have it written somewhere as well. Because I feel like when something like crazy kind of happens, all of that goes out of your brain and you like forget this really amazing plan that you had. So next, I'm going to quickly talk on the importance of educating providers. And this experience happened whenever, and some of you might have had this, but I had my wisdom teeth out. And I think I was like 19 or 20 or something like that. And the before I had them pulled out, the orth, whatever he is, orthodontist, whatever the person that takes your wisdom teeth out is, um, we had a good talk. I got factor before the procedure. Everything went well. But after, when I went back to see him, I felt like something weird in the back of my mouth. I felt very sharp. And he, he didn't really like remember my VWD or anything, but he, I let him look in my mouth at the time and I'll, I'll never forget this. He reached in and he just ripped something out of my mouth. And I think it ended up being like some kind of bone chart from the bottom of my jaw, but he totally ripped it out. I hadn't treated with factor prior. So I would say that is one of the longest and bloodiest car rides home. I had to drive. I never, I didn't come with anybody there. So I think the point of this story is is constantly re remind those medical providers who are unfamiliar with your dis disorder about it and bring it to the forefront of that conversation before they just start pulling things out. And with that, I think this is my last point on this slide and we'll move to the next, but I quickly just wanna touch on self-advocacy. So during, during COVID, I decided for my hobby, I don't know what hobbies you guys all did, but I'm sure we all got hobbies. I decided that mine was gonna be working out. And then I was going to get into the best shape of my entire life. And I, I was, and then like, I just started to like go up the stairs and like do things. I was breathing. Like I ran a mile, like super hard. And I was really lethargic. Like I'm really energetic. If you can't tell by like however many minutes we've been together right now, but I was kind of like quiet. 
and just not myself. So I was like, there's something that's gotta be wrong. So, you know, I took the initiative and I called my hematologist and I was like, can we like check my iron and just do like a blood workup or something? Like something's just not right. I do not feel good. Everybody's telling me I'm pale on Zoom. Um, and sure thing, if you see on like that right top corner, that's a picture of my, my iron over the years. And as you can see, it's been pretty low. And I think it's, at, I can't really see, I think it's at like 60 or something right now, but I'm at the highest I've ever been in my life and I feel great. So I really had to just advocate for myself for that. You know, with COVID, we've all been separated between our positions and, you know, I noticed something was wrong and they were like, wow, you're, you're right. So I think that it's just the message of this one is you are your own best advocate. And now I'm actually allowed to get iron infusions whenever I, you know, go back and get my blood work checked up. But I had to listen to my body and again, ask questions. So I think the relationship between a patient and a physician works both ways. And it's important to remember that, that we can't expect them to think in their head that, oh, maybe they're not this or that. Like you really have to bring it to the forefront and work with them both ways. So thank you for that. Next slide, please. And I'm quickly just going to touch on my motivation. So sometimes people will ask me like, why are you like so committed to this community? A couple, couple reasons. Number, I think one of the biggest ones is myself and my family were affected. And my, you know, specifically my grandfather went, I think like 65 or 60 so years without a diagnosis. And he had to suffer from some trips. Like they went on a family trip to Hawaii and he spent his whole time in the emergency room there. His entire time. Who wants to go to Hawaii and spend their entire time in the emergency room? And then, for example, like my mom, she was not diagnosed till she was 35 years old. And my mom had some severe bleeding issues. She had to miss a lot of like family events. She also struggled with iron anemia. She had a lot of bloody noses and she had some very, very serious postpartum bleeding after she had me and she was not diagnosed at that point. And um, last is my nephew. He's an awesome little kid. You can see him. Uh, he's like holding up, taking the selfie on that top picture. And my mom is the one on the bottom. And that's my grandpa on the right. I guess I should explain who everyone is. Um, and, but on the top, that's my nephew Tanner. And he actually has been tested for Vomilibran disease twice now. And he has tested negative both times. Tanner wakes up almost weekly with bloody noses. So it's to me like, you know, it, it's kind of adding up, right? Like I really think that he's got, He's got it. So with the new guidelines, um, which we'll talk about a little bit, some of those changes might make him actually be able to be eligible to have a diagnosis as the levels have changed. Next slide, please. And, and my, obviously I just said my family is 100% my motivation, but I also have some other people and that's all of you at home, all of you watching, anybody who's involved and advocates in this community, anybody affected, anyone's support network, um, you know, you guys really inspire me. Like I look at these photos, like the bottom one is at me at camp in Hawaii. The right is with like my, one of my little campers. The top is us running around on the golf cart. But you know, those moments in camp, you see the kids at events, if we were in person like these, you know, you, you, that's what does it for me as well. And this is what really motivates me and drives me. Next slide, please. And coming close to conclusion here, um, the BWD guidelines, what an amazing opportunity to be part of. I was truly humbled and honored to be part of this. And I, I was lucky to serve as a patient representative, um, panelist on the diagnostic guidelines, who Dr. Wayne will discuss in a few moments here. And just want to give a shout out to all the amazing people on that screen, both panels. Um, just thank you for all your efforts. And my, my participation included over uh, four years of emails and meetings and in-person and some Zoom calls. Luckily, the meeting and the photo right there happened right before the world shut down, which was absolutely amazing. I, I believe in fate. That happened for a reason. Um, but nonetheless, this experience was truly amazing, and it's taught me more than I could really ever imagine how to speak up, how to use my voice, advocate for others who might not have a voice, challenge people. There were some very smart people in this room, and sometimes, you know, you got to challenge people no matter where you're at. Um, so just wanted to give them a quick shout out, and we can go to my final slide to conclude us, please my message to all of you. So that was a lot and a little bit. So I kind of just wanted to do a quick recap that you are your best and your, your own best advocate. Think about edu educating providers on your bleeding disorder as an opportunity and not a burden. And I'm just give a little shout out to Dr. Oldham because we had to talk about this the other day. And I think it's really important not to give up when you have providers that might not be familiar with a bleeding disorder because you have an opportunity right there to educate them. Also prepare for panic mode, have a plan in place, preferably written, um, that will just help you when things maybe don't go the way you want. And last, get involved. You know, advocate for others who may not be able to advocate for themselves. 
Connect with your local chapter if you have one. Connect with NHF. Educate the general public, your school nurse, your friends, your family, people that are around you that might need to know, but whatever the best fit is for you. So with that, I want to thank all of you for your time and allowing me to share my experiences. And it is my pleasure to pass it back to Lita. Gosh, Nicole, thank you so much. I've heard your story so many times, but every single time you speak, I just still get these chills up and down on my arms. And I just love hearing your story. And I'm sure everybody else out there loved hearing your experiences and all the little ups and downs that you have gone through as well. So thank you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart and you can see the messages here in the chat coming through as well i think everybody really enjoyed and appreciated all of your thoughtful uh, comments and stories here as well so as you've heard nicole alluded to this a little bit and obviously it's the big topic of today are the vwd guidelines and you've heard many information about these coming out and uh, we've talked a little bit about the process as well so we want to just highlight again a little bit the guidelines of what the process was and some of the changes were and to this i would like to invite our second speaker who we have here today for our um big pre-con who's dr wyan she's a native of kansas city and she graduated from northwestern university in illinois she attended medical school at the university of michigan and completed her pediatrics residency at the university of washington and Seattle Children's Hospital. After that, she returned to the University of Michigan for a pediatric hematology and oncology fellowship. She was an NHF Shire Clinical Fellow from 2015 to 2017. And clinically, she's very interested in young women and girls with bleeding disorders or clotting disorders and is co-director of the combined hematology gynecology program serving this particular population. Her research interests are in women and girls with bleeding disorders, hormone provoked thrombosis, and of course, von Willebrand's disease. So with this, I would love to turn it over to Dr. Wayne here. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Nicole, for that very inspiring story. Um, it's always amazing to hear stories like that, where clearly you made such good out of um, some experiences that could have been better. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you a little bit about the Von Willebrand's disease guidelines. I was a member of the management panel. Um, I think that there have been a lot of presentations about these guidelines. So some of you may have heard a lot of before. So I'll just go briefly through um, kind of the process that we went through in um, making these guidelines. Next slide. So for Von Willebrand's disease, there's actually been a number of guidelines made previously, as you can see, um, in different countries um, and in different years, there had been many different guidelines written. And part of the impetus for uh, the most recent guidelines was to really try to have um, more consensus between um, the countries and so that we could all be um, working from the same place. So um, it was a collaboration between um, international organizations in order to come to a greater consensus, um, especially because a lot of these guidelines that had previously been published had. Um, specific guidelines that contradicted one another. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there were a number of collaborating organizations, including NHF, um, the American Society of Hematology, International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, and the World Federation of Hemophilia. Next. It was quite a long process, as Nicole alluded to. So, um, you know, the thoughts behind this were many years ago. Um, and it was a multi-year process, um, which included two in-person meetings um, and a lot of um, over the phone calls and uh, emails as well. This was prior to the pandemic, so there weren't so many of the Zoom meetings that were now getting uh, way too used to. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just um, kind of two pictures, one that Nicole already shared um, on the right is the diagnosis panel, and then on the left is the management panel, and I think that the organizations did a really great job in making sure that there was representation from patients, multiple patients on each panel, um, as well as a variety of different healthcare providers uh, that care for these patients. Next slide. I think one of the most important things that helped with the guidelines was that um, the collaborating organizations chose to conduct an international survey up front 
to try to really take in uh, to account everyone's opinions on what kinds of things to focus these guidelines on. I had never been a part of a guideline panel like this before, and the amount of work that goes into it is incredible. So you're really not able to answer all of the things that you'd want to answer. I think that everybody, when the guidelines came out, probably looked at them and thought, oh, they didn't talk about X or they didn't you know, mention Y. Um, and so because we were so limited, because there was such an amount, large amount of data to review for these guidelines, we were limited in the number of guidelines that we could make. And so, or recommendations within the guidelines. And so we really wanted to take into account a lot of shareholders' um, opinions when we went about informing the priorities and making these recommendations. Next. So with this international survey, there actually were over 600 responses and over 9,000 comments that were each gone through and read um, individually and then helped to inform the specific topics that were covered. Next slide. And as you can see, this is just a world map that shows in the blue patients and caregivers that responded to that international survey, as well as healthcare professionals um, in red. And so as you can see, there was representation um, from all over um, and quite a significant number of both patients and caregivers, as well as healthcare providers. Next slide. So this is a really busy slide, but I just wanted to kind of highlight the fact that um, this is a very standardized and regulated process. So um, Dr. Reem Mustafa out of the University of Kansas does um, kind of guideline development um, as her primary focus. And so she helped lead us through this process, which was um, quite intensive and involved reviewing a lot of data um, and reviewing it in terms of the quality of that data, evaluating benefits and harms, really thinking about patient values and preferences. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about um, how these guidelines would affect patients, um, including things like access to care um, and equity, um, as well as resource use. So um, we did have to kind of combine the, the recommendations to certain settings, which happened um, to have more resources, um, but we did want to always be thinking about um, how they could be applied elsewhere as well. Next slide, please. So for the diagnosis guidelines, this is just kind of an overview of the types of things that were addressed, um, including the use of bleeding assessment tools and how those can be used um, in settings where von Willebrand disease diagnosis is less common, such as primary care, to triage patients into whether or not they need von Willebrand disease testing. The diagnosis panel also looked at specific assays, um, as well as what we should do with patients whose VWF levels may normalize with age. Um, I think one of the biggest things that came out of the guidelines was the diagnostic threshold for type 1 BWD. So part of the inconsistency between prior guidelines was the diagnosis of low BWF, which was used um, in some guidelines to um, be a diagnosis for patients with levels between 30 and 50% that they didn't have an official diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease, but were instead labeled low BWF. Um, but our guidelines actually included all patients with any bleeding symptoms up to a level of 50%. Um, so that all, hopefully we can all be on the same page in terms of managing and diagnosing those patients. And then other specific guidelines um, that they addressed were diagnosis of specific subtypes um, within type two, as well as diagnosis of type one C. Next slide, please. And then on the management guideline, panel, um, we also address a number of different issues. I think one of the biggest um, recommendations that we really wanted to include was um, commenting on the use of prophylaxis. As Nicole mentioned, I think she had some difficulty obtaining and start getting started on factor. And I think that that is a challenge for a lot of patients with von Willebrand's disease. Um, you know, most commonly in patients who have type 1 and type 2 von Willebrand's disease, but even within uh, type three patients, we know that not all patients are on prophylaxis. And so that was something that we really wanted to address, especially with regards to um, ensuring appropriate access to treatment and needed treatment for patients in hopes that having a formal recommendation for the use of prophylaxis might be able to aid people, especially in obtaining insurance approval to pay for those products. Other specific areas that we touched on included um, whether or not a desmopressin or DB80P trial should be done prior to the use of DB80P or desmopressin, 
Um, the use of antithrombiotic or antiplatelet agents, which we know have a high risk of bleeding uh, within our patients with von Willebrand's disease. And then we also look at uh, management of major and minor surgery and then more um, female specific recommendations included management of heavy menstrual bleeding as well as neuraxial anesthesia and postpartum management. Okay. So with that, I will turn it back to Lena. Thank you so much, Dr. Wayne, for sharing that information and giving us a brief overview of the entire process as well as what some of these focus areas on the new guidelines actually are. I think everybody can clearly see that this is a very rigorous process that this wonderful panel followed, but I think it also shines through how the voices of the patients were really integrated and heard. Hurt. I think it's very unique for something like this to happen and it will serve our VWD community very well. Now, another element that really shines through when we're thinking about how to integrate the patient voice is how we're implementing these guidelines in the clinical setting. And many of these guidelines require a shared decision-making process. So some of these recommendations might lead a patient down path A or path B, and we need to come together in a shared decision-making process to decide what the best path would be for the patient. Next slide, please. So I wanted to take a brief moment to just talk about exactly that, what is shared decision-making. Now, this is a term that has been throwing around for a couple of decades, but the last couple of years, it has really made its way into clinical practice, and we're hoping that this will further increase. So shared decision-making is actually defined by Alvin and colleagues as an approach where clinicians and patients share the best available evidence when faced with the task of making decisions and where patients are supported to consider options to achieve in informed preferences. So what that essentially means is that we are really sitting together and having an educated discussion about the decision to be made. It also requires two important components. One, we need a consumer who is informed about the decision to be made and who is also willing to share their personal values and opinions about the decision. Secondly, we also need a healthcare provider who is willing to respect the decisions and values and opinions of the consumer and is willing to integrate these into the plan of care and the recommendations to be made. Next slide, please. Now, in order to make this happen in the clinical setting, there are several frameworks that have been proposed and the one that is most widely used is the SHARE approach. Now, SHARE is an acronym that really stands for the different components listed here. We're starting out with seeking participation. So by seeking participation, it really needs to be made clear that a decision needs to be made about a recommendation um, or about a treatment decision. So with this, the healthcare provider is really then talking to the patient and the patient is fully understanding that their opinions and values need to be integrated. Now, the next step is help to explore and compare the different options. So when we are in a shared decision situation, we might go down path one, and these are the pros and cons about path one, or we might go down path two, which then might also come with the following pros and cons. So we are really discussing this through, but we're balancing out the information without moving the patient into one direction versus another. And then we're really going into assess. And here we are assessing the values and the preferences of the consumer. Now, while a provider might prefer one treatment over the other, it might be different for you as a consumer. So we really want to have a great discussion about what matters to you, what is important to you, what would really truly move the needle on your quality of life. And that needs to be integrated into the decision. Now, then we are moving into reaching a decision. And again, we are having a good conversation about this as well with our patient. What is the decision that they do want to meet? And with this, we need to give time as well. If you as a consumer are not ready and you need more information, we need to give that time. And then ultimately, we will come and reach a decision of what treatment we might actually follow. Lastly, it's evaluate the decision. So did we make the right decision? Did we have the right choices or did something change? Do we need to go into a different direction? So we need to evaluate those steps as well. 
So shared decision making is obviously a big topic, but it is a much needed topic. And it's very much integrated into the VWD guidelines as well. So there are, are several recommendations within the diagnosis panel, as well as within the management recommendations where your voice truly matters because there are different choices that you can make based on your personal values and preferences. So with this, let's please move to the next slide. I would love to move our, to our panel discussion. So within this panel discussion, we will highlight several of the recommendations, especially from the management guidelines. Now, we will obviously discuss them a little bit through and highlight how we might actually include the patient voice in this, but also how we work within an interdisciplinary team. Dr. Wayne and Ms. Scappy will be joined in this panel discussion by Dr. Oldham. Dr. Oldham is an OBGYN who throughout her career has worked closely with the um, HTC at Rush University. And she has had a great focus there in addressing gynecological issues in people with bleeding disorders, especially also those with VWD. So with this, I would love to turn it over to our amazing panel and hear what they have to say about some of the recommendations with our, our management guidelines. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start um, with a 24 year old with type one bone malignancy disease and heavy menses. Um, I think that Dr. Oldham and I have both probably seen many um, patients similar to this. So I just kind of wanted to talk through, um, especially from a gynecologic perspective, um, if someone presents to you like this, there's already a known diagnosis of bone Willebrand's disease and they're having heavy periods, what that conversation kind of looks like um, from your perspective, Dr. Oldham. Hi, um, the conversation is already accelerated with a patient who has bone Willebrand because she already knows that she's got a condition that's gonna be difficult to manage and, um, and her goals, need, we need to know what her goals are. Um, and we need to also know what her current bleeding pattern is because she may be bleeding very heavily or it may just be every single day. What is your goal? Do you, do you want to stop bleeding right now because it's really getting in, in, in the way of your activities of daily living? Or is it just that it's every day, uh, you know, sort of inconvenient bleeding that we want to sort of micromanage and, and, and tinker with a few different modalities? With someone who's 24, it's very likely that she's sexually active, not necessarily, but it's likely that she is. And so using hormonal birth control at the same time, we're trying to manage the bleeding profile. Those two things can be very convenient, but also a little bit tricky too, because we're we're, we get into the issues of compliance. Um, so as you know, birth control uh, pills are, are, are a wonderful way to stop bleeding acutely with a Von Willebrand patient, but also something that can we use over time to try to manage bleeding and also prevent pregnancy. Um, but now we have so many different modalities for the prevention of pregnancy and also to manage bleeding to, to a great degree. And those things would include, you know, all kinds of long acting reversible contraceptive agents like the IUDs with progestin in them or um, uh, subdermal implants that like Nexplanon that go in the arm that are inserted pretty easily. We also have the uh, contraceptive patch and two now uh, contraceptive vaginal rings, the Nuva ring, and there was, there's one also called a Nerva that a lot of people don't know about that is a one year re reusable vaginal re contraceptive ring that we can use that also reduces bleeding as well. So it really depends on where she is, what her goals are, and, um, and if we really are trying to prevent pregnancy or not, because uh, if we have, contra if we have co compliance issues, we might wanna change things around a bit. Absolutely. I think um, like two points that you made really resonate with me. I think one, like the contraception issue, um, and that's kind of how we broke it down in the guidelines. So the guideline recommendations are that if someone's not desiring pregnancy, that hormones or an antifibrinolytic like Lysteta um, should kind of be first choice, first line um, versus obviously if, if someone's trying to conceive, then um, that would just go to Lysteta. But I think your point about um, the pattern of bleeding is really important. Um, I see mostly adolescent girls and oftentimes, um, like you said, you know, it's going to be different if someone's having a little bit of bleeding every day versus having five days of really heavy bleeding. 
I find that if you're having a short course of heavy bleeding, something like Lysetta can be really great for that. But if you bleed every day, you're probably going to need hormones to, you know, kind of regulate so that that's not, so that you're not taking, you know, Lysetta every day doesn't really um, work so well, especially if your bleeding isn't even that heavy. Um, but Nicole, do you, um, I know that one thing that I've been amazed with in my clinic is just the understanding or lack of understanding um, because we don't talk about periods as much as we should. And so oftentimes um, I'll ask patients like, how are your periods? And they'll say, fine. And then when I get into the details, they'll, you know, they're bleeding three out of the four weeks of the month and, you know, having accidents or um, not able to, to sleep at night because they're soaking through. Um, was that something that you felt like um, was an issue for you when you when you presented with heavy menses? Great question. And it was, but I wouldn't talk about it. So I think that this is really crazy. I'm going to just share this with all of you, but I, there's another session we have. Um, it's called VWD, the reality is your period. And I actually have never really talked about this in a public setting before. So I think that Dr. Oldham magically got me to start talking about this. Um, it's been like 30 years of anxiety, but I did have those issues and it did suck. For example, like I was, an, I was a very athletic kid. So you'll hear about this in another session, but my friend shared a story about her having a specific game and having to run to the bathroom like every other minute. And I just could sit there and shake my head and be like, I know what you mean. And you're terrified that like, you're going to run a race and track and something's going to be like on the back of your shorts or, you know, you do the high jump and it's something's going to happen. So I, I definitely remember those moments. And I just remembered that I did suffer a lot in silence, to be honest. And I didn't talk about it and I just had the heavy bleeding. But um, as I got older, I really feel like it just became so significant that it, I I couldn't function. So I was like, I guess I have to talk about this. Um, and I had already had kind of issues with like factor. And I kind of felt like, you know, I was nervous about my joints and things like that, because I was like, well, is it going to be hard to get factor for this too? Because I didn't really know if the pill was necessarily for me. Um, with like my family, I know that it caused like mental issues. So for me, I, it wasn't an option like or something I wanted to look into. But I think if I would have like went back and looked, I could have talked about it. Like how you just talked about with Zita or like just had a conversation with the physician about it versus being like, I'm not doing that. And if you can't do that, then I'm just going to suffer. So to answer your question with a long winded answer, I would say yes. And to anybody that deals with that, have the conversation. Channel your inner Dr. Oldham in your head because that's what I do. Um, and I said like the word period now on talks and calls, which is really weird, but like I feel comfortable with now. So thanks, Dr. Ryan. That was my little two cents. Yeah, I mean, it's something that half of the population does, but you know, people still, it's very stigmatized. And I think, um, especially with bleeding disorder community, if your mom had really heavy periods and then you're having really heavy periods, you know, usually mom's buying like the pads or the tampons or whatever. And so no one outside of you two may even be aware that that's happening. And I think it's really unfortunate because a lot of girls, you know, like you said, just don't do things because, you know, they're afraid that they're going to like, I have patients who say like, oh, I don't swim or I don't, you know, yeah. whatever. Oh, swim class, forget it. <laughs> yeah, and, and we know that exercise is so important when we're before and after, before and during our period. So you know, we want to encourage that that we that we address this issue. And I think I'd also like to say that um, we, you don't give up. There's so many different opportunities to try to to address this. And sometimes we don't just use path A and path B. Sometimes we combine these things. Sometimes we start with one thing and we switch it around. I tell patients all the time, it's sort of like like going and see a dessert tray, and you can kind of choose what you want. And you should tr you should try those various different things throughout your life because you might find that. One month, one thing works. And for the next six months, another thing is going to work. And maybe you're getting married. So you want to do something else for your honeymoon. I mean, there's so many different options that we have. We just, we don't give up. Absolutely. And I think um, just like you said, like, I think it's so important not to get frustrated because I think we, I think Dr. Old and I were just having this conversation um, where you know, sometimes you'll get a referral and someone has been started on something that doesn't really make that much sense considering they have a bleeding disorder. And so of course it hasn't worked, but then for some of those patients, probably they think, okay, well, hormones don't work for me when really it's the specific type of hormones or the specific type of pill um, that wasn't effective. And, and like you mentioned, there's so much out there now that um, I think it's very rare that we're not able to find something um, that works. Exactly. Um, maybe we'll go to the next slide. 
So speaking of, um, you know, usually finding something that works, but oftentimes having to do a lot of trial and error. Um, in this case, the patient had tried um, a form some hormonal therapies, probably more than one. I think my experience has been that um, we oftentimes will try, you know, multiple different um, either pills or like a pill in a patch, you know, some combination. Um, but this patient had tried a number of different hormonal options as well as um, Lysteta in addition, and still was having a lot of pretty significant bleeding. Um, so in this case, Dr. Oldham, what kind of would be um, your thought process on, on approaching this patient? Well, I'm a big proponent on making sure that we've ruled out other gynecologic issues that could be in play also. Um, sometimes we just, you know, we, we kind of hyper-focus on one thing. And when someone has a, a diagnosis of a bleeding disorder, we, we tend to really just focus on just the bleeding disorder when actually you could have a patient who has uterine fibroids, endo, endometriosis, adenomyosis, things that, you know, have bleeding uh, manifestations people who make ovarian cysts because they don't ovulate every single month, patients who have polycystic ovarian syndrome who don't ovulate every single month. So we really should look into other potential risk factors because when you um, have the two to come, come together, a bleeding disorder, and then something else gynecologic happening that causes bleeding, you often have fireworks. So um, I would say labs to rule out other gynecologic issues, Imaging is big. I think it's really important to make sure that we don't have something else going on that needs to be addressed, not necessarily surgically, sometimes so, um, but certainly to see if there's something else that we need to manage at the same time. Even thyroid disease, hypothyroidism can cause, you know, a lot of bleeding complications. So there's other things to consider. Um, obesity. So we should be looking into other issues first. And then again, we don't give up. We are considering factor in our patients. We, um, we, we want to potentially even use, you know, a birth control pill to taper down to stop bleeding and then transition or overlap into something else at the same time. It's safe actually to use sometimes two forms of hormonal birth control concomitantly to get things under control and then kind of, uh, you know, tailor the, the treatment over time to something else. As long as we don't have, you know, contraindications or any kind of, uh, you know, side effects that are um, not tolerated, we can, we, there's a lot of different ways for us to try to manage this, but we do want to do it as a team. We want to make sure there's a team approach here. Absolutely. I think that's really important. Um, what you're saying about like non-hematologic causes for bleeding. I think we all get into our little areas where, you know, to me, every girl who has heavy menstrual bleeding has a bleeding disorder and to, you know, a general gynecologist in the community, yeah. every girl who has heavy bleeding has anovulatory cycles. And, you know, I think um, it's very easy to get narrowed in on things, especially if someone comes to you already with a diagnosis. Um, but as we all know from practice, people can have more than one diagnosis and um, oftentimes that can lead to even more problems. Um, I think that, you know, within the guidelines, we did um, talk about heavy menstrual bleeding and did kind of refer back that if someone's having severe and recurrent bleeding, which heavy menstrual bleeding definitely can be, um, that factor prophylaxis should be considered. I think this is an area that's um, kind of a place where we underutilize factor because um, it just hasn't, you know, luckily we have a lot of non-factor products that work like hormones and antifibrinolytics and some people use the ADP, but um, I think because there are so many options, it leads us to think of factor a lot later than we possibly could. Um, so like for Nicole, I know, you know, you eventually got started on, on factor, but um, it sounds like that was difficult to get there. It was a little difficult to get there. And I think some of it was due to my own stubbornness as well. I'll just throw that out there as well. But, but it really was because I feel like the, the joint bleeding was like sooner. It came before my menstrual cycle. So like I was like used to that. But I'm like, so I got to infuse on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then you mean to tell me for this next week, I got to be infused in these days too. Plus I'm a hard stick. This is, you know, but I... The more that I like, it worked for my joint bleeds. So like, I always know that if I have a joint bleed or not, because like, it'll get real big and it'll kind of start to go down once I take factor. But if it doesn't, I know it's actually not a joint bleed. Um, 
But I think that I just got to a point where I started to travel so much and like, you know, getting involved in this, in this community right here. And I'm like, I can't, I can't get on the plane and get off the plane in time. I'm like, what is happening? What's going to happen if I go from here to there? So I think I really had to make the decision my, myself to do that. And I think my mom really encouraged me to do it as well. I was kind of, I was over 18 at the time and she was kind of just like, listen, I tried and you said no, so you figure it out. So I really had to just kind of figure it out myself and like be an adult. And eventually that led me to that decision. But it's weird that you like bring it up because I really don't know. I don't know why it takes so long to get to factor. Like, I feel like it was always straight birth control. And if you don't want that, sorry. Um, but things have changed since then. I'm not saying like, I'm not being negative here, but things have definitely progressed in the last 15 or so years. But for me, it was like, that was it. And, you know, again, having to document all of those things. And I'm like, how do you document this? And they're like, well, we got this little chart you measure and all that. So like, it just was a lot of learning for me and lots of questions and asking. And um, yeah, I guess that's kind of how it led me into it. But again, back to that point at the beginning, like you got to advocate for yourself or you're just going to suffer in silence. And I, I think the documentation piece can be really helpful, not only for like the physician, but even for like insurance, if it becomes an issue of them not wanting to reimburse. I think the more data that you can kind of have, um, not only, you know, to show how much you're bleeding, but also I think um, what Dr. Oldham was mentioning about like pattern of bleeding. Uh, I think sometimes when you are having heavy periods, it probably feels like you're bleeding all the time, a ton, um, you know, and so it's helpful to actually have you know, really um, specific data to help your physician. Um, That's helpful to hear you say that too, because I was like, I'm not filling out this chart, but really like after having some sincere talks with like different, you know, providers, like it really, I like had some deep talks about like, why do you really need that? What are you going to look at? Am I wasting my time? Why am I going to fill this piece of paper out? But it truly does help. So agreed, just seconding that. <laughs> And I think you have to, like from a physician perspective, you know, we kind of have to think of ourselves as detectives in terms of, you know, I've had patients who say um, the birth control isn't working. And I'm like, okay, so come to find out that it was because they had a really hard time remembering to take the birth control. And so it wasn't that it wasn't working, but if you're not taking it, then, then clearly um, there's no way it's gonna work. And so that patient actually ended up doing a lot better with a patch where they didn't have to remember to take it every single day. Um, mm -hmm. But I think those sorts of things, you know, if you don't dig in deeper, I could have just said like, okay, well, like, you know, hormones aren't going to work for you next and, and move to something else. When really, um, there was a possibility that that would have, that would have worked. Mm -hmm. Should we move to the next? Um, so, uh, moving out of my patient age, um, that I typically see as this patient's getting older, um, they are now interested in becoming pregnant. And as I mentioned, the guidelines actually um, divide, you know, patients with heavy menstrual bleeding into those wishing to conceive and those not as the treatments um, are obviously different. Um, so uh, I wanted to hear a little bit about um, your approach to, to patients who want to conceive um, as obviously this really restricts the use of a lot of the things we commonly use. The, this patient is, it's so important for this patient to be seen by her obstetrician or delivering provider well in advance. And what, what I mean by well in advance would probably be three to six months before she wants to go off of her treatment, which would probably include contraception um, because we know she's gonna, she's gonna have some bleeding. We don't know what that bleeding is gonna look like and that is going to get in the way with her trying her efforts to get pregnant. Um, and it's also going to maybe create a, a confusing clinical picture if she's using, for example, an app to figure out when she's ovulating. It could just create a little bit of confusion. So it's probably a good idea to meet with your provider three to six months, I'd say minimum ahead of time to determine when you're gonna go off of that contraceptive agent. Um, and then uh, keeping in mind that you might have a patient who also has another issue um, like polycystic ovarian syndrome where, where it's sometimes difficult to get pregnant because ovulation is not regular or it could be someone who has had um, another condition like an endometriosis or, or an infection of some kind where we're worried a little bit about um, the potential for tubal occlusion. And we have to remember that we have a partner involved. 
involved. And so we wanna make sure that we have a little window of time to, but not too big of a time to really assess what's going on with her clinically, um, should she have any difficulty. But we're balancing that with the fact that we may have a bigger issue. So we're gonna have our Lysteta or Factor or something um, in our back pocket so we can make sure that if we do have uh, an episode of bleeding that, that's extreme or unexpected, that we have our plan in place. Absolutely. I think um, I don't uh, envy the people taking care of these patients. I, when I think about the, a lot of the bombal grants that these patients I care for, um, you know, a lot of them are, are very dependent on hormones for, for control of their bleeding. So I think this really kind of complicates things. And um, I think, you know, in an ideal setting, we could say, okay, you know, you want to be pregnant in July, so we'll have you stop things in May or, you know, whatever. Um, but I think we all are, you know, aware that infertility and um, problems with conceiving are common. And I think it can be really difficult, um, especially in these patients, if they're having heavy bleeding um, to continue um, having that um, also in the setting yeah. of, of having those sorts of difficulties. Am I the only one that lost my view of everyone? Oh, I can see you. Okay. I can't see you either, but... I guess we can just keep chatting until whatever happens. <laughs> well, I, I'll give you a patient who I, I really actually had a patient call me who worked for me. She's in a medical assistant yesterday. And um, it was probably about four or five months ago. Couldn't have been six months ago that she said to me, she wanted to have, she wanted to get pregnant right then and there, but she was bleeding so much that she was, had a hemoglobin of nine and really was having difficulty coming to work. So, um, PCOS and adenomyosis does not have von Willebrand, but she was bleeding every day because of these two things coming together and creating a problem for her. So I put her on um, birth control taper to shut her off. And then we train and then her hemoglobin, you know, rose, got her on some iron and got, she has PCOS. So she had high blood pressure. So preconceptually, we put her on nifedipine for her blood pressure because we knew that was going to be a, part of a problem pre-pregnancy um, and during pregnancy. And then I put her on what we don't have in your recommendations is a GnRH antagonist for adenomyosis, which shut off her periods completely. And so she was on it for about a month and she became very lightheaded and she was at work and she had to sit down. And one of her colleagues said, let's just run a pregnancy test. And lo and behold, last week she found out she's pregnant. So going uh, preconceptual consultation, I just can't underscore how much it's really important to really get to the bottom of it because usually not one issue only that we need to address and the anemia piece, we have to address that. We do not want our pregnant patients to be anemic. We want to try to correct that as best we can because that baby is gonna steal all that iron. And so we, we, those are all the kinds of things that we need to consider preconceptually and I know all providers really do appreciate having that opportunity to talk to patients ahead of time. Absolutely. And I think um, like from my perspective, probably one of the biggest takeaways that I would say I'd like patients to, to come away with is like the importance of that multidisciplinary collaboration. I think that um, having hematology and gynecology, whether it's you know in the same like dedicated clinic is optimal, but I think if you don't have that, making sure they're communicating um, if there's other people that need to be involved, like in chronology or you know, anesthesiology, once you get into pregnancy and those sorts of things, um, I think that's, that's so very important. And I think your point about anemia is so important because um, we know that not only is it not good for the mother, but it's also not good for the baby if mom is iron deficient and anemic. Um, and I think so many patients um, that I see, especially who are seen um, elsewhere first, um, are checked for anemia, but not necessarily checked for iron deficiency, which we know is very common um, in our patients. And that oftentimes, you know, they may not yet be anemic, um, but you can have a lot of symptoms of iron deficiency even without being anemic. So um, making sure that we're testing all of our patients for that um, and treating them appropriately, I think is very important. Should we move to the next? So luckily our patient got pregnant. Um, and so 
um, is thinking about planning for the delivery. Um, I think you know one of my you know recent points really applies here in terms of involving other specialties early in this. Um, but how has your experience with these sorts of things been um, with planning for these types of procedures? Well, it was not long ago that if uh, one of our bleeding disorders patients was in labor, she could not have uh, she could not have an epidural or a spinal. Um, now I think it's commonplace. I think we know it's safe, um, but we do need to to infuse factor. At least that's my experience. Is that we're using factor generally at least a day beforehand. So what I recommend, and even if even if that's been given, if an anesthesiologist who is on call uh, and caring for the patient at the time that the epidural or spinal is needed, they are not comfortable with that. They may not do it. Um, and they have the right to withhold that, um, that care if they don't think it's safe, or don't understand what the plan was. So if a patient is at a center where there is a pre-anesthesia clinic, my strong recommendation is for the providers caring for the patient throughout the, the delivery should make sure that the anesthesiologist is seeing the patient ahead of time, making sure that if she is anemic, she's gonna get an iron infusion because they, they may require that. Um, and they also will just want to know the treatment plan. They wanna know that everybody is involved and everybody knows what's going on so that you know, if it's not that particular anesthesiologist caring for the patient intra, uh, during labor, that their colleague will be very comfortable providing um, an epidural or a spinal during uh, during the labor intrapartum period. Do you have a sense? I really, I, I really don't know the answer um, to this. Do you have a sense of how common it is to have that sort of clinic, like have like a formalized, you know, setting where they have like a pre-anesthesia clinic? Is that? Do you have any idea? Um, here in Chicagoland, uh, the various different institutions I've worked at, yes, there are teaching institutions. They do have them. But I would imagine even a community, small community hospitals, where actually there's a tremendous amount of collaboration that goes on, sometimes not formally, um, yeah. that I think it's just, it's really just about you know, staying in close communication with one another. And I, I, I don't think that it would be difficult to do anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, if there's not a formalized process, I would imagine that most anesthesiologists would appreciate someone reaching out ahead of time and saying, you know, heads up, this is coming. And, um, you know, we'd like to plan ahead for it. Because I think the worst case scenario is what you were saying, where, you know, someone's expecting to be able to get an epidural and then anesthesia you know, shows up and says, we're not doing this. And I'm sure anesthesia doesn't want to be in that situation either of being um, the bad guy saying that, that that's not going to happen. Um, exactly. So, but I think um, the one thing that we at our center always try to um, kind of follow is that, you know, we want our patients to be able to do the things that people without bleeding disorders do, right? And some of those things, you know, we can't, like, I, I don't really think anyone should box, but especially not people with bleeding disorders, but like in terms of an upper girl, right, that should be something that, that we should be able to figure out for um, patients and women shouldn't have to suffer through, um, you know, childbirth if, if that's the decision they make is, is wanting an upper girl. Um, so I think that's something that as physicians, we should be able to make happen. Well, if I ever have kids one day, Angela, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I mean, I just can't imagine how hard that must have been before when, or, and probably that still happens in places where you're just told that, you know, that's not an option for you. Um, I personally um, was very grateful for my epidurals when I gave birth, so um, I'd like them to be available for everyone. Um, and and then, of course, of course, we have to remember, though, that sometimes they don't work perfectly, and we still have, you know, pudendal blocks and we still have other, you know, ways in which we, we, we discussed, you know, the fact that doulas are, you know, now reimbursed. Uh, and so it's nice to have a doula in the room. Midwives are great with intrapartum pain. Um, so there's a whole 
lot of different options that we should be providing for our von Willebrand's patients that, that should be identical, yes, to our patients who do not have bleeding disorders. Yeah, and we were having a little bit of a discussion about this um, where, you know, I think it should be a, a team, right? Like we have a whole team of people to help you um, that all have these different roles. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, I think our country could do a little bit better job of supporting um, women in pregnancy and, and postpartum, but um, as much as patients can advocate for themselves and try to get as many people involved early on um, as possible, I think the better things will, will go. Um, but with the guidelines, really, um, the question we were addressing was just kind of factor levels to aim for with epidural anesthesia. Um, unfortunately, there is not a lot of great data, um, but the panel eventually settled on just looking for normal levels, so between like 50 and 150 percent um, would be adequate for epidural anesthesia. So maybe we can move to the next little slide, which um, really is just talking about postpartum bleeding, um, which I think is something that um, we're all concerned about, you know, with women in general, but also specifically with um, women with von Willebrand's disease. Um, and so I was hoping you could share with us um, kind of how um, you approach that with um, patients and kind of how you counsel them on what to expect and when to come in or when to call. Well, you know, Nicole mentioned something in, in her um, session about having a plan when you're going to, you know, your, your kind of your bleeding plan. And I do think it's maybe worthwhile to consider that in this set of circumstances, because yes, we worry about postpartum hemorrhage in all postpartum patients. And clearly von Willebrand patients are gonna have the same risk factors that anybody else does, except if it does occur, it's gonna be far more dramatic and far more life-threatening. Um, so the things that I would say are that right after delivery, Usually what we're doing is we're checking vitals. We're doing all these various standard things. We're doing pad checks every couple of hours, so on and so forth. There's the immediate postpartum hemorrhage risk. And then there's this kind of subacute within two weeks risk too. So immediately postpartum, the, the vitals may not tell you exactly what's going on moment to moment and beat to beat. And mom is tired. She is sleepy, she wants to go to bed. And this is the patient who may wake up six hours and she's being left alone because you want to leave her alone and give her some time with her baby and she may have bled out. So this is a patient who I don't think in the first 24 hours or so gets to just be left alone. I think that we make sure that we're checking in on her every two hours or so in that first 24 hour period of time, if not one hour, because if she's lost a lot of blood after immediately after delivery, that may be a clue. Um, but just within that first 24, 48 hour period of time, we really need to be ahead of things because the vitals, your typical, your, your our typical way of measuring blood loss and hemostasis are not necessarily going to be as accurate for our patients immediately postpartum because we lose so much blood. There's so many fluid shifts that are happening right after you have a baby and the placenta comes out. So um, I would say monitoring more closely, not less closely is one thing. Um, and then the other thing we do is we remove the Foley catheter. Blood, uh, blood loss is first measured by urine output. So if a urine output drops acutely, we know our patient's losing blood faster than when her vitals change, her blood pressure and her heart rate. So we might even consider if she, if, especially if she has an epidural keeping her Foley intact for the first out, first day or so, even though everybody wants the Foley out so she can walk to the bathroom and all that, but we might wanna keep it in. So those are some things to think about depending upon you know, how stable, what the risk factors are, so on and so forth. But then when she goes home, she's probably not gonna be scheduled to see her doctor for six weeks. And I would not recommend that. I would say probably within a week to two weeks, follow up with your um, at least the nurse in the office, hemoglobin, get your vitals checked, you know, and assessment. I think it's, it's important to, to watch our bleeding disorders patients much more closely in the immediate postpartum period of time. 
Absolutely. I think it's um, in my mind a little bit similar to periods in terms of it's very hard to, to quantify blood loss. You know, we can say like it's a problem if you're changing your pad more than every two hours or, or these sorts of things, but it's really difficult. And I think it's something that um, whether you've had a baby or not, like it's like you said, the person's so tired and like so much is going on. You have a, you have a new baby, right? And um, so even if you've had a child before, you may not remember what that was like in terms of blood loss or if that was abnormal and you're comparing what you're having now to that, um, I think it's, it's really difficult to know what is abnormal because it is a situation. I think, you know, with um, a lot of the bleeding stores with men, like you shouldn't have any bleeds into your joint, right? But like periods, we expect you to get a period or postpartum, like we expect there to be some bleeding. So we can't really say like cause with any bleeding. Um, there has to be a lot more um, kind of specific guidance on when to call and when to, to be concerned. Absolutely. And within the guidelines, we just kind of covered the fact that um, things like Lysetta, which is an antifibrinolytic, um, are very helpful kind of probably with all of our patients postpartum that have bleeding disorders um, and should, should be considered in all of those patients unless there's a reason not to. Um, so I don't know. I see that there's been some questions and it looks like Lena is joining us. Of course. So first and foremost, Dr. Owen, Dr. Oldham, and Ms. Gabby, thank you so, so much for this really insightful discussion and highlighting some of the recommendations from our VWD guidelines. Really loved listening to um, all of you and how you are tackling this in a more clinical setting. So obviously there are many more recommendations within our diagnosis and the management components of the guidelines, but we only have so much time. So there's only a few that we could really highlight here. Um, so really make sure you check back on the other ones as well. But um, each and every steps that this patient went through has a specific guideline in the management component to it as so. So with this, I would really love for us to transition over to our Q&A, and there are some great questions that have come in from the audience that I would love to pose to you and have you talk on as well. So one of the first questions that came in here is, with the recent nasal stymied recall, in your practice, are you still performing DDAVP challenges with either IV or subcutaneous Desmopressin as an option for management in the setting of bleeding um, unresponsive to antifibrinolytic or for surgical planning trauma purposes? Yeah, so um, as probably a lot of people on are aware, the um, recall of stimming has been um, not good at all um, and very frustrating for a lot of people, especially given that um, it's been unclear when, when it will return. Um, we have done both um, at our center, I think, um, depending on the patient and the procedure. I think um, the nice thing, the biggest advantage to intranasal stimate in my mind is that people could do it at home. And so oftentimes, um, you know, they wouldn't necessarily either could have their procedure and go home and, and do the stimate at home. And so um, since you lose that and you're having to do IV, we have not had a lot of um, success getting you. I know there's um, some centers that have um, been using that, but um, for us, we at times have just used um, BWF factor instead or BWF instead of um, instead of DDAVP, but, but we've done both. Um, so I think they're both reasonable kind of depending on uh, the procedure that's needed and um, patient circumstances with logistics and stuff. Absolutely. Just to stay with this topic a little bit, um, in your practice, do you, um, do you plan to give a uh, fund bill brand factor and skip the whole challenge at all? Since we, we have, we have done that. Um, I think that um, what we've done with those patients is typically said, like, you know, at some point we'll want to do the challenge with you. Um, but if we're just planning to use factor, um, we don't necessarily have to do it right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's another wonderful question that came in, is what would be some examples of contraindications for oral contraceptives? Okay, so um, to be contra, <laughs> to have a contraindication would mean that you have probably some sort of medical condition that might cause clotting. Um, 
another one would be it's relative, but another contraindication would be uncontrolled hypertension. There's a lot of cardiovascular issues that are problematic. There's a lot of um, buzz around rheumatologic issues that we, again, we, co we collaborate with our rheumatologists to try to make sure that patients can use oral contraceptive pills, but because of the risk of thrombosis, most rheumatologists are, will say probably not. Uh, patients with vascular migraines or even sometimes headaches that we can't classify. Neurologists are very uncomfortable with the, with the use of oral contraceptive pills. Um, so those would be big ones. There are a lot of, a lot of those issues are cardiovascular issues. Um, and then common sense would tell you that certain cancers, things like that, certain very complex disease states would, would make, would not make sense. Breast cancer, um, those kinds of things. But most of, most of the contraindications are cardiovascular issues that a patient might have. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Dr. Olam, here's another question that's actually more targeted towards you. Could you speak a little bit more about vaginal rings? Do they help at all? And how would somebody use them? So um, the contraceptive vaginal ring has, it's combined hormones like most of the birth control pills that you've heard of. Um, they're not made by the same pharmaceutical company. So they have two different kinds of progestin. So they have Synthetic, synthetic estrogen and a synthetic progesterone-like, really testosterone-like, but progestin in them, but different. One of them, well, both of them you're supposed to use in cycle. Yeah, hopefully you know what I mean by that. You're supposed to put it in to your vagina. It's a flexible ring. You will not feel it. Believe it or not, the vagina is a pretty big place. So this little ring can fit in there comfortably and it stays there generally without any problems. And it is to be removed generally speaking, every three weeks with a week off for a withdrawal bleed. I don't recommend that for a patient with a bleeding disorder or a patient who just doesn't want to have her period. It's very safe to keep it in. And a lot of times patients forget to put it back in after seven days. And after seven days, your risk of pregnancy is much higher. So there's one ring where you have to get it refilled every single month, so to speak. And then there's another ring that's new FDA approved in 2018, but very much more known to the public now, uh, that's a year, you keep it for a year. So you just kind of clean it off and, and put it in a little case and keep it there. Um, but again, for a patient with a bleeding disorder, I wouldn't do that. I would actually use it continuously, keep it in um, for the three weeks and then switch it out. If it's the disposable that you have to renew every single month, or I would just keep the other one in every day. Um, and neither of them have really been studied in patients with, with bleeding disorders. This is off-label, but this is off-label also for patients without bleeding disorders. And if it works, it works. I find that if I withdraw bleed, my von Willebrand patients, they bleed more. I find that if I keep the hormonal, the artificial hormonal milieu the same every day, be it a vaginal ring or a pill or a patch or whatever, that I can control the bleeding profile better. So hopefully I answered your question. I thought that was a wonderful answer. Um, so here's another question that uh, both Dr. Aldam and Dr. Ryan, you can comment on, but what do you do when you live in a rural area? What are your thoughts on integrating midwives and doulas in the entire process and how can they actually partner best with the HTCs? I think they're essential. I won't, I won't speak though. I'm gonna let you speak, Angela. <laughs> Go first, please. I'm, I'm happy. I was just gonna say quickly, just with um, the rural thing, I think um, that can definitely be challenging. Um, I think that luckily one positive of the pandemic is that we are doing more virtual care. Um, so for us, we have, I'm in Michigan and we have a lot of people in the UP, um, which is very far from where we are. Um, and so we've been able to do a lot of their care virtually. And I think that um, ideally, if you have like a hemophilia treatment center that you can get to once a year that can just know you and see you and um, kind of know what's going on, then they can hopefully 
provide guidance to um, physicians and people that are closer by um, that you know can help more with day-to-day -day things. But I think if you can establish care um, somewhere, um, that that can be really helpful in case things come up that local um, providers don't feel comfortable with. And I would agree 100% with Dr. Oldham in terms of um, incorporating the wives and doulas is, is fantastic. Yeah, I think that's, that's really great. So I've had babies myself too, and they had actually the doulas as a um, staff person in the hospital themselves. So there was great access. And then they agree with this too. So I um, have a couple more great questions that are coming in here from our audience that I do want to address too. So um, Dr. Wayne, this is actually one question more directed towards your area. So you've highlighted many of the management recommendations of the new VWD guidelines, but what about the diagnosis component? So we've heard there's two different um, elements here. So are there any important recommendations to enhance earlier and better diagnosis of VWD? Um, you know, I think the only one that kind of addresses um, like pre, you know, pre getting to a hematologist for testing is the use of the bleeding assessment tools. Um, and, you know, basically um, kind of um, triages patients into risk groups based on um, what setting they're in and um, the use of bleeding assessment tools, which are just validated, you know, questionnaires that can kind of say how concerning your bleeding is from a more objective standpoint. Um, I think that, unfortunately, in my mind, I think a lot of education just needs to occur um, in people in general about like what normal periods are, not only patients, but, you know, even physicians, I feel like there's not really adequate um, medical training about periods or that you need to really ask a lot of detailed questions. And because it's um, an uncomfortable topic for people, the questions just aren't asked. So like I said, I think you can ask somebody how your periods are and a lot of teenage girls don't wanna talk about it and will say they're fine. And I think in primary care, they're so busy and have so many things to address, right? In a short visit that if someone says their periods are fine, there's probably not a lot of, um, digging into what exactly that means. Um, so I think a lot of patients are probably missed that way. I know we see girls that come in and have to get, you know, blood transfusions because they've been bleeding so heavily. And um, it really would be optimal if we could identify those patients earlier um, so it doesn't get to that. Great, thank you so much. Um, another great question that came in from our audience um, here, and this is again towards you, Dr. Wayne. How has type 1C testing been updated with the new guidelines and are there any changes in testing for subsets of type 2? Um, so for type 1C, the recommendation has been to um, perform like a DDAVP challenge to, so with a DDAVP challenge, if people are not aware, basically we um, get a baseline tap BWF panel on a patient and then give them desmopressin and DVABP um, and then measure their levels. And there's not really a standardized approach, but a lot of people will do an hour after it and then four hours after it. Um, so with type 1C, where you have premature clearance, you would see an increase, but then um, that rapidly decreases back. Um, and so that has been the recommendation for testing versus um, some people have also used propeptide, um, which is just kind of another lab test. Um, but the recommendation in the guidelines is to use um, the trial. And then there are a few um, kind of really specific um, things to type two, just in terms of some of the subtypes um, re recommending genetic testing versus more functional testing. Um, but a lot of that, there's not really great data to support. Um, and depending on where you are, um, one thing may be possible to get versus another. Thank you so much for sharing. So Nicole, the next question that's coming in is actually targeted towards you. So oh as a patient, gosh. you are, isn't that nice? <laughs> so good question asker. <laughs> so obviously you have been long in this community, but you have also been part of the panel. So um, while you were in that process of developing the guidelines, did you really feel integrated and did you feel your voice as a patient was heard and integrated or did you kind of feel more overwhelmed with the entire process? I felt like I was 
I was all in. It was very overwhelming at first, but I'm the type of person that like has to figure things out. So I'm going to be the person to ask infinity questions. So I feel like I remember um, at the very beginning, like Mark Skinner pulled us into a room and they like really like talked to us like because he he did he was on the guideline panel. So he really shared his experiences and like what our role really is, because I think that was the thing I didn't really understand. Like, what is my role? Some of this stuff, I don't, what is this? What is this all? But like a lot of it, I know that I did have a voice in. And I would like to say the other patients as well. Um, but they just kind of like, one cool thing was like, we were able to talk to the physicians if they were, uh, we called them by first name. I don't really know how to, how to say that, but like, we didn't say Dr. Wayne. It was just like Angela and um, you know, whoever. So that was really nice. It made me feel like I was an equal almost um, because I don't have those lovely MD titles that y'all work hard for, but I've worked kind of hard as well. So I think that was that was really helpful. And I think that they, the, the entire folks who planned all this, they, they always offered like moments for us to have sidebars and just like have a chat about like, okay, I'm so lost, bring it back. Like, I, I don't know, but I also as well, like the conversations move fast. I remember being there in the room, but I was able to at some time to like, Google real quick, like, what does this word mean? Or what is this? And I'm like, okay, I'm back. Like, I'm here. But I do feel like I was brought in and the physicians online made every effort to make sure I was good. Um, I remember sitting next to Dr. Connell and I was like, what does this mean? And he just like whispers to me real quick. So really, like, I'm just the question asker because I think that I had a purpose on that panel. And if I was just going to sit there and be quiet, I wasn't the right person for that panel. Um, and I think the overall message that I want to voice for my other panelists was that like, people get access to care female, male, boy, girl, woman, bottom line, we want you to have access to care. And that was relayed like the whole time by all the patients in that as well. And some of the patients had a little bit more of a scientific background. So they were also able to kind of like ask questions and challenge other positions. But the last thing is it was very cool because we had people from all over the world. So like the way that somebody's going to treat somebody in Australia may not actually be how like it happens in Canada or the US. So while doing all the guideline, like you had to keep in mind like the the world international impact, right? So long answer to the question, but I felt like I was 100% in, asked questions, did calls. And I was also very grateful that we were able to do this in person because I don't think it would have been the same. I really don't like, it's just, I remember like yesterday whenever the world shut down and it was like maybe three or four weeks right after we had that meeting. And I was like, thank goodness we were able to do it. So thanks Lena. Yeah, you're welcome. You were very lucky that you got that last final meeting in there right before our so world lucky. shut down. So lucky. And this is like a little bit side off, but I think it's a funny story to just quickly share. But um, right, we're, I'm in the room with like the best hematologist in the world, right? And all of a sudden, like, we're like voting on something and I start getting a bloody nose, like BWD world, right? It happens. And I just hear, I can't remember if it was Dr. Connell or, or um, oh my gosh, Paul, Dr. James, but I heard someone go, I think she's having epistaxis. And it was just so funny because to me, it's a bloody nose, like not epistaxis. But I was like, I guess if I'm going to bleed in a room, this is probably the best room to bleed in because I got the best hematologist in the world with me right now. So just a funny little story about how bleeding happens all the time, even when you're on the guideline panel. Yeah, you surely were in the absolutely best hands there. Right? Couldn't be in any better position. No, for sure. <laughs> So there's another great question that is coming in from our audience here. And um, Dr. Ryan, maybe you can talk a little bit about this. And it's about aging and von Willebrand. So I know there is a specific recommendation about this in the diagnosis um, guidelines as well, of how to deal with the changing von Willebrand factor as we are aging. So if you could comment on that a little bit, that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, this is an important um, thing to tackle. I actually just had a discussion with a patient in clinic about this yesterday, um, who was a little bit upset about this recommendation, but I think, um, so it's, it's good to clarify what they meant. So um, I think that um, we, we have known um, that BWF levels increase with age. And so especially for patients who have type one von Willebrand's disease, it may be that as they increase with age, um, at some point, at some age, they will have normal von Willebrand's levels. And so the um, question that the panel wanted to answer was, what do we do with these patients, right? Should we continue to treat them like they have von Willebrand's disease or um, say, well, now your levels are normal, so you don't have von Willebrand's disease. And I think, um, you know, I think some patients heard that the recommendation was that you can consider um, taking, you know, the diagnosis away. But I think um, the key thing to realize with that is that 
it's going to depend on the patient and, and what their bleeding is, right? So if you have had epistaxis your entire life and your levels go up into the normal range and you're still having epistaxis, then they're not going to remove that or they shouldn't remove that diagnosis. Um, there are probably some patients, I don't really see adults, but there are probably some patients who their levels normalize and their symptoms that they previously had, if they don't have those any longer, then there may be a benefit to you know, considering removing that diagnosis if, you know, there's really good evidence that, you know, they're no longer going to be at an increased risk of bleeding. Um, but I, I don't want patients to worry that, you know, if you're still having bleeding symptoms, um, especially, you know, um, I had a patient bring up, well, what if, you know, she's not having periods because she's on all these medications, and then they say, well, you don't have, have heavy menstrual bleeding, so you don't have them. But clearly, you know, if we're managing the symptoms with treatment, um, then we can't really consider, you know, your bleeding problems to be gone. Um, so I think, you know, they didn't really say, you know, the diagnosis needs to be removed, just that, you know, we should really be thinking about each individual patient and what bleeding they're having. And if everything really does seem to resolve as their levels increase, then that's great. And, you know, hopefully um, some of those patients can, you know, have one less doctor's appointment and um, worry a little bit less, but there's probably going to be a significant number of patients that um, their numbers normalize, but they continue to have bleeding and we'll still can need to require care. I'm glad you brought that up, Angela, because that is something that like that specific guideline, it really applies to my, my younger brother who is I think 22 now, but let me just give you an example of why it was positive to take his diagnosis away for him. So he wasn't symptomatic at all throughout his childhood, like had no issues whatsoever. And he had a goal to join the Navy, um, the United States Navy. And if he had bubble brand disease, he would not have been able to achieve that goal, right? So, you know, no symptoms for years. So that is an example of where it actually benefited him to be able to do what he wanted to do. So I kind of just wanted to bring that perspective in as well. It kind of seems like dark and like, don't take it away. It's not really about like taking it away, but it's giving the option. And if it's not affecting your day to day, you've had surgeries and you haven't really bled, like, you know, check all your cross your dots or T's and I's all, whatever I meant to say. But um, I just wanted to throw that out there as well, just as an example. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Nicole. Um, again, there's pros and cons. And one thing I wanted to highlight here too, it's really, again, that place of shared decision-making, right? Where your voice really matters and it matters of where you want to take your life and what you want to do and what is important to you. Nicole highlighted that with her brother who really wanted to go into the Navy. So his values and his opinion and his preference is being considered in making that decision of what is happening with the diagnosis component here. So um, one thing I want to leave this discussion with is if you had to give one piece of advice, just one, um, for our audience out here of how they can really enter into a shared decision-making process and how they can utilize these guidelines and benefit from them, I would love to hear that as we're ending this session. Um, I would say, you know, the more... Um, collaborative multidisciplinary team you can get um, the better and then just to be persistent I think you know we have a lot of tools at our disposal and um, if you're you know honest about your goals and honest about your symptoms then we should be able to help you with any of those and help you you know do the things you want to do and feel well and um, not have a lot of bleeding um, and if you're feeling like um, that's not happening um, then you know continuing to advocate for yourself and whether that means a second opinion or just, you know, continuing to return and bring up the same concerns. Um, I think that's really important to get um, the care that you deserve. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that's a, that's a great point ending on as well. We are right on time with our session. So just as a reminder, please make sure that you do give us um, some feedback on this session. We will utilize this to form our next sessions for next year. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for being here and joining us today. And welcome to our 2021 Bleeding Disorders Conference. Thank you.